Now we're moving to our indirect threat care. Threat's been neutralized. We now have that victim either in a safe place away from the threat or we've taken the threat away from the place we're working. So we put chest seals on if there's an injury here, but those chest seals are for uh, respiratory. Um, those help keep the lungs inflated and remove any trapped air um, through a vented chest seal. Okay, so just keep in mind when we're putting chest seals on, it's not for bleeding, it's for airway compromise or uh, respiratory lung issue. Um, so neck to navel, we're gonna put a chest seal on. If there's internal bleeding here, not much we can do about it. Most of y'all have already done wound packing stuff, so we're not gonna spend a bunch of time on this. Um, just make sure you fill that entire void, that entire area. Yep, so that PVC is representing a bone. You've got the tissue around it. We're gonna pack that tissue down to the bone and then we're gonna wrap around it with a pressure dressing to hold it in place. Okay, so we got wound packing gauze. It's Z folded like this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit. I like to make a little ball at the end first. Make a little bit of a ball just so you've got some bulk. We're gonna sweep any blood out and try to figure out where it's bleeding. If it's bleeding right here, I'm gonna put immediate finger on there. Compression and we're stopping bleeding. We're keeping that blood inside the body. I'm gonna take this ball, feed it down in there with my other <laughs> sight and hold it into place. Now, I'm just gonna feed this down in there and I'm gonna to continue to fill this entire void and I'm packing all the way around because if I just stack it up like a leaning tower of Pisa and then I put pressure on it, it's gonna collapse over and I'm not holding pressure. I want this entire void space filled with gauze now. So I'm just filling this entire area until it sticks out over that wound. Once it sticks over it, the rest of this goes on top. Hold firm pressure in place for a clotting and then I'm gonna start wrapping with a pressure dressing to hold it into place, okay? Okay, I'll take this back off, I'll let y'all pack it. So you can use regular gauze for this. You use regular gauze, pack it in the wound, um, and it's just holding pressure on there. You use combat gauze, and it's got a kaolin clay in there, which actually absorbs some of the water and causes it to clot faster. So when we're using quick clot or combat gauze, we wanna hold direct firm pressure on there for three minutes. Now that doesn't mean you have to do it with your hand. You can use it with a pressure dressing, but that pressure dressing needs to be tight enough to be holding good pressure for three minutes. If you use regular gauze, 10 minutes. Okay, same thing with sea uh, locks. That'll be three minutes for a different type of hemostatic. Pierce, explain to everybody what you're doing by twisting. Um, when you're wrapping around there, you can put a lot more pressure on a certain spot when you twist it and apply. Basically, you have a lot of surface there on one side and it puts all the pressure in the middle wherever you twist it. And then you can go back to wrapping it to keep the bandage still. So and you can adjust where you do it to make the even pressure over the whole thing. Okay, so we've got a severe arterial bleed, junctional area. We sweep the blood out, we find the point of bleeding, we stick our finger on it. Immediate direct pressure. Take our quick clot, tie a little knot in the end or something if you want, so there's a little bit more bulk, put it at the point, pack it finger over finger to fill that entire void, take the extra and put it on top. What if I've got a big gaping wound like this and it's bleeding in here and I pack a whole thing of quick clot down in there and I still got more space, now what? I need more stuff in there, more gauze. I don't need to put an extra quick clot in there because this is already doing the control, bleeding control. I just really need gauze or something to backfill it so I can put pressure on there. So yeah, I just keep filling this up until I have enough bulk here to be able to put pressure so it is putting pressure where it needs to to compress that artery. Then we'll wrap it, okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, Okay, we've wound packed. We've got this pad here. Some of those railies have a second movable piece that you can put this on one side. If it's a through and through, you can move that movable piece to where it's on the back side. Now you've got two components of it. Um, but once we start wrapping this, the first wrap is just going to be to hold this in place. It's elastic, so we're going to do that to hold it in place. We take this first one, we slide it in here, and we pull it back to where it creates a V, and it's putting pressure directly on that wound. If it's not on the wound, take your time and go ahead and move it to where that pressure is going to be on the wound. So that thing is sitting directly above the wound, yep. pushing down on it. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. It gives you, a, and then, it gives you leverage pushing down. Well, we're not using this for leverage. We're not using this to pull against it. We're just setting the angle. So this is not very tight right now. It's just tight enough to set that angle. And then every subsequent wrap, we're gonna start pushing that angle down into that wound. We're just gonna wrap the whole thing. But now I've got a V and I'm gonna put all these wraps on there. And then at some point I can do Pierce's little trick, right? I can crisscross it and put it directly on that V. And when I do that, it's just gonna drive that V down into that wound and it's putting all that pressure right where that bleeding is. Does that make sense? That plastic tab is just a V for pressure. That's all it is. 
it makes sense that you like want to loop it through and you make a two to one out of it and you pull and you get extra strength on it. But really all it is is that V that and you're putting on top of the wind. Correct. The North American Rescue ETD does not have that. It's really just a pressure wrap like that is. And then you secure it with Velcro at the end. And what type of injury are you doing that on? These are, right now we're just talking junctional. Later when we get down to the circulation, we'll talk about converting tourniquets for wound packing and stuff. But if it's an extremity and it's severe bleeding, we're gonna put a tourniquet on first. If it doesn't, if it's not severe enough to need a tourniquet in this phase, we're not doing wound packing. So right now we're putting tourniquets on extremities. We're wound packing junctional areas, which is also the neck, um, and that's how we're that's how we're handling it for here. We'll talk about conversions in a minute. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, some of y'all may have already seen my trick, but toss me that. Let's say I've got a, whoops. Let's say I've got a uh, neck injury. Caden, come up here for a second. Caden's got severe bleeding to the carotid. He could be laying down like that, that's fine. But I'm gonna pack that wound, I'm gonna put pressure, gauze on top of it. Okay, I've wound packed this and now we got pressure. Hold that there, Caden. Okay, I'm going to have him lift his arm. I'm gonna wrap from here, I'm gonna put pressure. I'm gonna go up underneath here. I'm gonna wrap this and see how short this is between his armpit and here. Wrap this, use this plastic clip, secure this into place, hook it on both sides. Now I'm gonna have him lower his arm and it's gonna stretch this and hold firm pressure on this side. We have to be careful of this airway. This, some of this scooted a little bit far forward, but we have to make sure that his airway stays open, but we hold pressure on this side. So doing it under the arm like that can put pressure on that side. To your head, you have two arteries, two carotid arteries. Um, these carotid arteries uh, both supply blood to your brain, so if one gets severed and you put pressure on it and include that bleeding, you still have one bringing blood to the brain. So we can occlude one of these and he's still gonna get blood to the brain. We wanna keep monitor that airway. So um, if he ends up you know, moving around and now his neck is you know, getting pinched or something, we wanna keep an eye on that as we monitor him and trend him. But this is a safe way to be able to put pressure on one side and hold good pressure. Does that make sense? Okay, let's talk about uh, junk, improvised junctional tourniquets for a minute. A strap that goes over here. So if you have bleeding um, in the armpit area, um, in the axillary, you're going to put that around it, put the strap in, same thing, you're gonna inflate this and hold pressure here. So those are great, but they're expensive, several hundred dollars for one. So we are going to go over real quick how to improvise at least a um, femoral junctional tourniquet. So let's grab two SAM splints. Do we have a second one out here? Why did I say Sam Splint? A cat tourniquet. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. My bad. Here's what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hook these together like I showed inside. So this is hooked to here. We're going to move it around. We're going to put it around like a belt. We're going to put it over the femoral. We're going to take a Yeti cup or something hard. We're going to put this in the femoral. And now we are going to tourniquet this down on there. Remember, when we have something protruding and we put a tourniquet on, there's now a void space. We want to try to keep this void space on this other side that's unaffected, unless you have a double amputee. If you have a double, amp double amputee, we're going to do two of them, and we're going to put these on, and we're going to hold them in place, okay? So we're going to use two tourniquets together, make a belt out of it, put something firm, rigid in there that's going to hold pressure, and then we're going to tourniquet that down on it to hold that pressure. So you would want to typically have something larger than that. Um, we're using that for right now. Does someone have an empty Yeti cup? Yeah, I spilled all mine. There you go. Now we're on to airway. So with airway control, the first and simplest thing we can do is airway positioning. Um, we've got our airway here, our trachea. If that person's head is too far forward or too far back, we can end up manipulating that airway to where they don't have an open airway. So hopefully this patient's still breathing on their own and we're gonna hold that airway open because they may be um, unresponsive or lethargic enough to where they can't hold their airway open on their own. Also, if they have decreased mental status and they're laying in this position, that tongue is now pushing or gravity is pulling that tongue back on the back of their throat and it's gonna start occluding that airway. So there's a couple things we can do. Um, I always preach positioning over MPA or airway adjuncts. That should be the first thing we do is position. We may be able to be, be able to position this airway, open it up and we're done. If you're out somewhere and you have an active shooter situation or something, let's say you have one person you're treating, 
You don't have to have an MPA. You can hold this airway open and keep that airway open manually holding it. Now, the reason the military started putting these in there is, well, I'm gonna do something to this patient, I'm gonna go on to another patient, and then we're gonna throw this guy on a stretcher, we're gonna get him out. We're, we don't have someone sitting there holding this airway open. So let's take a MPA or a nasal trumpet, let's stick it down their nose. This goes down their nose and sits in the back of the throat behind where that tongue would have flopped down, and now we've got a straight shot from their nose back into their throat where they're breathing from. That's holding our airway open. So if you're just providing care for one patient, we can hold an airway open without having to put these in there, but you have to hold that airway open. So if you're trying to run a really slim medical kit on an ankle kit, you don't have to have one of these. Like if you have one person, you can hold that airway open. Now, if for the military, um, you know, if they're providing care to several people and doing evac care, you slide this down there and you kind of forget about it and that helps hold that airway open. So that's why these are in the kit. So we'll go over them uh, today, we'll use them. Um, has anybody ever messed with these? You haven't, everyone I think here has except for you, so. Jed, you're up. So, um, all, oh, you gotta do it on yourself? It will make you cry and you'll have a bunch of mucus running out your nose. It's really fun, it's a good time, but uh, we, won't, we won't make you do that today. So, nasal trumpet, it's just an open hollow tube. It's got a little flare here, so when you put it in, that little flange keeps it from going all the way down in the nose. Um, a lot of times there's little lube packets that come with these. It just makes it easier to go down. If you're having an issue trying to cram it down someone's nose, I use cram loosely. You want to slide it in. If you have any issue, um, you can even use their blood or some people are like saliva. Yeah, just stick it in your mouth, stick it in. You're just trying to get some sort of lube to slide it down. Otherwise, if it's really dry, you have a hard time pushing it in there. There's a significant amount of pressure. If you ever stick one in yourself, you will realize. You put it in, you're like, oh, it starts pushing on all your tear ducts and everything. You start crying. It's, it, it's fun. But So what we're going to do, there's a bevel. That just helps. It's like a dart. just helps it go in a little smoother. The right nair is typically bigger. So unless they have a deviated septum for some reason, we're usually going to go on the right side. And see this curvature is already going to sit naturally on the right side anyway. Bevel toward the septum. We're going to slide it in. And we're not going to go up. We want to go straight down. So we're going to take it here. We're going to go in. You can twist back and forth. And it literally just goes in and you slide it into place. Okay. That's in place. And now they have an airway from here back behind their tongue that's an open passage. And I don't have to be as worried about positioning their airway and holding their airway open. Does okay. that make sense? Yep. So here, let's throw that down the dummy. Also, did you say measuring, is it from the earlobe to the corner of the nose? Or yeah, so when we're measuring these, we want to go from the earlobe to the corner of the nose. That's about the same distance as where the back of the tongue would be. They're like, ah, oh, that's pretty close. Let's use that as an external landmark to measure from. So we're going to measure from the nose to the earlobe. So that's about right for this guy, right? Typically, the most common size is a 28. So you're not going to hold, stick six of these in your first aid kit, typically, if you just have a simple IFAC or something or medical kit. So typically 28 is the most common size. That's what the military uses, it's like all 28s um, on their IFACs. Um, so I guess if you really want to be proactive, you could size it to yourself and stick that in your IFAC. So if someone uses it on you, it's whatever. But um, typically uh, 28 is a pretty common size. So that's what most people carry. Slide this in, wiggle it back and forth, slide it into place, use a little bit of lube or uh, saliva or blood or something if you have to, to get that into place. So that's, that's the MPA. Before we get there though, let's talk about airway positioning. So we've got someone snoring respirations. That means the tongue is sitting on the back of the throat. We can do a head tilt chin lift, which is literally just taking the head and, let me use this guy. That guy's head doesn't move. Snoring respirations, we, the head is pushed up, so it's putting pressure on that airway. And now he's snoring respirations because that tongue is being occluded, um, occluding that airway. We literally take this guy's head, we lift it back, and when we do that, it stretches right here and it pulls that tongue up off the back of the throat. That opens the airway. We can hold the airway open this way. Um, another way we can do it is a jaw thrust. So if we're worried about spinal damage, rather than taking his head and going, hey, let me fix that for you, and making his spinal damage worse, we can take this jaw line right here and we can push it up and we're gonna push and displace that jaw out of the way. So we're gonna use our hands on the cheekbones, we're gonna pull up underneath here, we're gonna push it forward, and we're gonna displace that jaw. That tongue is attached to that jaw, so when we push that up, it's now gonna push that tongue up. One other thing I wanna go over with airway is the recovery position. This may even be something that else you can add to your direct threat care. 
is the recovery position. Let's say you have a patient and you're going through, shooter's still out there somewhere and you're putting a tourniquet on or something and you're trying to get initial tourniquets on people that need them and you've got someone with storing respirations that's unresponsive, you may be able to quickly just plop them over in the recovery position and that helps hold their airway open. So let's talk about the recovery position for a minute. Caden, would you mind laying down? I'll pick on you for a second. Caden's laying down, tongue's on the back of the throat, so we're gonna hear snoring respirations. So, right? He's got occluded airway from the tongue. He's not breathing as well as he should. We wanna open that up. Also, he may have blood in the airway or vomit or something in the airway. And if he sits just like that, that's gonna end up going down his airway. He's gonna aspirate, he's gonna have a blocked airway. We're gonna have issues. Take the opposite arm and pull it up to here, okay? Grab the knee, pull it up, and then we're gonna pull him over and this hand's gonna flop underneath like that. Does that make sense? Grab the opposite arm, grab the opposite leg, pull this up here and then prop that arm up underneath. First thing we're gonna do is position that airway. If we have to leave them, we can roll them in the recovery position to keep that airway open. If you have an MPA with you, you can drop that in an unresponsive or even a responsive person. But typically we're doing this on someone that is either decreased mental status or unresponsive, or we're worried he's gonna go that way before we have a chance to come back to him, okay? If they're completely fine and talking to you, you don't need to be like, be still, let me stick this in your nose. Because it's not very comfortable, okay? So we've got massive hemorrhage, we're taking care of bleeding. Tourniquets on extremities, wound packing, junctional areas, improvised junctional tourniquets if you want to there. We move up here to airway. We're positioning and MPAs primarily. Um, this really should be in respirations. I don't know why that's it. So airway, we're opening airway and we're putting MPAs down. Make sense? So someone drag this guy down here to the next station. Mm -hmm. 